So I'm here today in uh, outside Cambridge. What little city were you in? We're in Little Ariswell. Little Ariswell, where Dr. Fred Brooks is here on a sabbatical. And it worked out well for us to get together for this interview, so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to spend with you. We're here for uh, an oral history for the Computer History Museum, where we'll be taking a look at the far-ranging things you've done and, and maybe get some insight from you for the generations to come in terms of advice and lessons learned. But I'd like to begin back at the very beginning, and let's sort of walk through this chronologically here, Fred, and tell me where you grew up. Where were you born? I was born at Duke Hospital because my father was teaching chemistry at the University of North Carolina, and that was the nearest hospital at the time. <coughs> and I, then when I was about six months old, he decided to change careers, went to medical school, and after finishing medical school at the University of Michigan, he settled in Greenville, North Carolina, a town in the center of the coastal plain in the eastern part of the state. And I grew up there, and that was a great place to grow up because of the superb school system. It was the home of a teacher's college, and so all the teachers we had in school and in high school had master's degrees and supervised student teachers, and so had a, a, a really excellent education. I think it's interesting that one person a year ahead of me in my high school, our, our graduating class was about 100 students, was John Mayo, who was later head of Bell Laboratories. So it was a little backwoods town, but never mind, we got good education Marvelous. in Greenville. And another small world story we'll get back to, there was someone else very special born in that same hospital yes. around that same time. Yes, <laughs> yes. We'll come back to that. Uh, were you one of many children? Were you one, one of three, three, three boys. Youngest, and middle? I was the eldest. Uh -huh. I am the eldest. Yeah. And Tell me a little bit about growing up. What did you like to do as a kid? What do you remember? What did, what well, did people say about you? I enjoyed school, and we had a great neighborhood with three kids on either side of us, and they, they, they matched ages, so there were only four ages for nine kids. And we, uh, we had a half-acre yard, and we lived next to a railroad track that had trains going by on it to watch and enjoy. And we fought World War II in trenches dug in the backyard and jungle gyms and whatnot in our yard because we were just barely too young to be seriously engaged. And, uh, and I always had a fascination with business equipment, and so when the local corset factory went bust, I bought a comptometer and filing cabinets and stuff. You know, I paid $4 a piece for filing cabinets, and I think I paid $35 for the Burroughs touch-operated adding machine <clears throat> and made my own McB key sort system for keeping track of my map collection. So I've always been fascinated with the kind of machines that process information. A map collection, because I see maps on the wall here. What did you collect as a child in terms of maps? Road maps, state maps, National Geographic maps. Marvelous. So this yeah. Burroughs machine was your first computer, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and you spent most of your childhood growing up in that area then? All of it. <clears throat> I'm just we moved, we moved uh, there when I was four. Uh, are you in touch with any of your childhood friends still? Oh, yes. We had a high school reunion not long ago, and I'm in touch with several of them. Um, five of my class of 90-some-odd became university professors. As a matter of fact, one of them is just retired at Chapel Hill, where he founded the Institute for Arts and Humanities. So, Small world. Uh -huh. What was your favorite subject in school? Physics. And what was your least favorite subject? Physical education. <laughs> Did you do much sports as a kid? No. Ah. No. I'm clumsy and awkward. <laughs> physics. Tell me about the state of physics back then. This is, uh, gosh, the time of Feynman and Oppenheimer and all that. Well, but the it? state of high school physics hadn't changed much. It's essentially Newtonian mechanics, electricity and magnetism, a little bit of acoustics, a little bit of optics, you know. 
And that's what began to fascinate you that eventually led to your doctorate in physics. No, my doctorate was in computer science. Oh, okay. But I, I did my undergraduate major in physics. Oh, that's right. That's but, right. But I knew I was, when I was 13, in the little town library, which was given by a native son who went north and made a fortune in shoe machinery, I read in Time magazine about the Harvard Mark I. It had this great cartoon by Art Zuberchef on the cover of the Mark I machine. And I knew from then on that that was what I wanted to do. Wow. And so in, in college, in addition to doing a physics major and a math major, I did economics, I did accounting, I, and, and as well as the humanities because I knew that was my interest. And the head of the physics department was determined that his best students should go to Harvard and study physics, and so two of us did. But I told my advisor, I said, well, what I really want to study is computers. And he said, Fred, you're too late. He said, you can't get in on the ground floor but said you can catch the first landing. And that's the story of my life, is I caught, I caught the first landing. And that means that I had a chance to meet uh, and really get to know uh, Press Eckert, John Mockley. I met Conrad Zusa, didn't have much luck talking with him. We had to talk through translators. I never got to meet von Neumann, and Howard Aiken was my thesis advisor. So. Uh, so I got to really know the pioneers, even though I wasn't of that generation. Right. <clears throat> and that's been a great joy. So Eckerd and Mockley, what, what was your interaction with them? How did you two connect? Uh, conferences. And back in those days, conferences were run on much lower budgets, and they put two of us in a hotel room, and I got put in the same hotel room with Press Eckerd at a conference even though he was UNIVAC and I was IBM, so. <laughs> well, this jumps ahead a little bit to your IBM career. Let me go back to, to college for a moment. Your undergraduate degree was from? Physics. In, from what Duke University. University. Duke. And what year did you graduate there? 53. What, what were you focusing on in your physics study? Anything in just, particular? Just general no, physics? just general. Uh -huh. Okay. And then, I mean, uh, you know. Right. Mechanics, electricity, right. thermo, yep. modern physics. The, the usual stuff. And it was at Duke you met uh, this young lady that was no. born? Oh, it was later then. No, that was at Harvard. Okay. So the, you went on to your undergraduate degree, then your graduate degree, your master's degree in physics as well then. No. Okay. I went, <laughs> so I, went, I, I went to Harvard. Okay. But instead of going into the physics department, That's I right. went into the comp lab. That's right. Which was part of the Division of Engineering and Applied Physics. Who were some of the people that were in that department at that time? Well, it was a very small group. There was Aiken, which we knew as the boss. And he had some friends on the faculty that participated in all the PhD committees, and we took their courses. But uh, the, there were two young instructors. Ken Iverson finished a year ahead of me, and Bob Minnick finished a year ahead of me. Bob Ashenhurst and Peter Callinger and I finished the same year. No, Peter finished a year ahead. But Minnick and... and uh, Iverson, Aiken swore in as instructors. And so um, the whole crowd gathered at 5 o'clock every day in the m machine room, which by now had the Harvard Mark I on one side and the Harvard Mark IV on the other side, uh, each machine about 60 feet long, <coughs> for coffee. If the boss was in town, coffee at 5 o'clock was de, de rigueur. And we, would talk for a half hour, 45 minutes, and then he would go home to supper and we'd go back to work. And uh, so at the end of my first year, he, at coffee, he told Ken Iverson, he, who was finishing that year, I would like for you to prepare a course in the application of computers to business. And nobody had ever taught any such course anywhere in the world. And so my, uh, I had had trouble with uh, a course in boundary value problems, so I wasn't continuing my NSF fellowship next year, so I went to Ken, I said, can I be your teaching assistant? Because that right down my alley. And so they housed us in the same office, and Ken and I then 
He prepared the course and I was his teaching assistant and helped. Out of that came our book, Automatic Data Processing, which went through a, an edition based on the IBM 650 and then a, four or five years later, an edition based on the 360. And Ken was uh, fully as important in my education as Aiken was. Aiken was a very impressive person. And he did something I can't do with my students. He came to my office every day and wanted to see the prose that had appeared since the day before, the year I was working on my dissertation. And guess what? Some had appeared <laughs> since the day before. And tell me about the choice of topic for your dissertation. What did you finally end up with? Well, he said, said, I want you to, to design a machine specialized for payrolls. And I said, that sounds like a good topic. I was interested in the design methodology. He was more interested in the machine. In the event, I ordered the two together. And so the dissertation ran about 500 pages, including the things I was especially interested in and how you get from the requirements, as it were, to the machine. His hypothesis was, was that by specializing a machine for payroll, you could make significant improvements in cost performance. That turned out not to be the case. It turned out that by specializing a machine for serial file processing, master file in, transactions in, new master file out, routine orders out, you could. And that was the, essentially the machine I designed for my dissertation. But there were, there were no, uh, no further economies to be had by making it specialized for payroll. I had the tremendous advantage of getting offered a summer job at the Marathon Oil Company, Ohio Oil Company it was then. Now it's a division of U U.S. Steel or vice versa. In Findlay, Ohio, uh, one of their, their treasurer came through talking to Aiken about how to mechanize his payroll. And I indicated I was interested in that. He offered me a summer job. Well, there was a little group. Ohio Oil Company operated in 40 states with a centralized payroll in Finley. Finley is a little town of about 20,000 people south of Toledo. <clears throat> and the headquarters of this worldwide oil company, strong in production in Libya and many other places, as well as the Marathon brand of gasoline that you see in refineries and pipelines, the whole works. Well, this little group consisted of the manager of the punch card installation, who was on, leave, was on special task force, the manager of the payroll department on a special task force, a bright young accountant who had joined the company recently, an old-timer who had worked in every division. He had started as a roustabout in the oil fields and then walked the pipeline and worked in the refineries and, and, and me. My job was to, they had decided on a 650, and so I was the computer scientist to help them get, the, figure out how to get it on the 650. And that was priceless experience with a real multi-state payroll, seeing all the complications. And I got hold of similar kinds of detailed data from three other outfits, so I had a spectrum of payrolls to analyze and understand. And the complexities in business data processing are the fact that you're trying to lump a wide variety of cases under a single process. And so typically on the 650, when it was doing business applications, half of all instructions would be conditional branches. And that's not true in scientific computing, for example. So this helped me a whole lot. And it helped me as a computer architect because I was, I was also doing scientific computing and spent a summer at North American Aviation doing missile tracking and database building and so forth. Uh, and a summer at Bell Labs trying to figure out how to identify which party on a full party line is dialing this call, and, and a summer at IBM and Endicott, which I learned punch card machines, and I was in the physics department doing acoustics. So the order was IBM, Bell, North American Aviation, Ohio Oil Company, but those four summers were a priceless part of my education, and they exposed me to radically different corporate cultures 
and radically different geographies. And I knew by the time I was finishing my PhD that I didn't want to go into the missile business, that it was too up and down and in and out. And, and the, at North American, at least at that time, the relationship between the management and even the professional staff was colored by the heavy unionization of the plant. And so it was almost hostile. Whereas at IBM and at Bell Labs, you're part of the team. And at Marathon, you know, this little five-person group, that, that was just really great. <clears throat> so back to the Mark I and Mark II for a moment. The Did you, quote, program those? No, they're, I they're, never they're, programmed the Mark I. Uh -huh. The Mark IV we programmed is starting first, first semester. I mean, that's what we learned was to program the Mark IV. And my, my present colleague, Bill Wright, and I, were, he had come from Duke, too, so there were... Uh, undertook for our first year project to write a program that would analyze melodies and create synthetic melodies using a eightfold Markovian process. And that took us three years to get done. But when and the problem is what do you what do you use for a sample? Well we needed as big a corpus as we could get. So we chose common meter hymns because we could find a lot of them that already had a same metrical structure. We transposed them all to the same key, then we analyzed the transition probabilities of the melodies. And the, the interesting question was, is there some order at which you get something that sounds like a human could have written it, and yet doesn't replicate a chunk of your sample? And what we found was that at orders five and six, that did happen. At seven and eight, we replicated sample halves. And it, at uh, two and three and so forth, you wouldn't have mistaken it for human music. But at five and six, we got stuff you could pass off on any choir. Amazing. So we I'm covered, that was one of our first papers. As wow. fact. So are you a bit of a musician? Do you sing? No, no, no. We were using this as a model of okay. language. We were interested in doing this with English, but that takes too much sample. So we picked these just melodies as a model language to try the methodology on and see how it would work. So what was the nature of programming back then? What languages, what tools did you have? Uh, the machine, the Mark, the Mark IV was programmed in decimal absolute. It had 230 re <coughs> registers and 10,000 words of program storage and 4,000 words of backup drum storage. And so <coughs> there weren't, wasn't an assembler. But Aiken had designed a relay box that enabled you to encode it in algebra <coughs> algebraically. And so... <coughs> Bill and I did part of our encoding on the relay box and part of our encode <coughs> encoding in uh, decimal. The program, our first program for determining the Markov frequencies, ran about 2,500 instructions. We, <coughs> we were allowed two shots on the machine in the semester, and each one hour. And it's the only big program I ever wrote that ran right first time. And <coughs> so what do you attribute the fact that it ran right first time? Extensive desk checking. <laughs> <laughs> Marvelous. Wow, that's not a lot of time to, uh, to test and debug because you had to get it right. <coughs> wow, right. marvelous. So l let's proceed on then. So you, you finished up your <coughs> master's degree then. And tell well, me... the master's was a... En passant, on the okay. way to the PhD. Oh, got it, on the way to the PhD. Um, the machine that you had uh, <laughs> proposed, the, the one you designed for doing payroll, was it ever built? Oh, no, no. It was a, a thesis project. Got it, got it. So you were <laughs> clearly you know, very influenced by those four summers. And oh, then, very much so. Yeah. Do, do you have much contact <laughs> with the people you were working with back then? No. Uh, most they, most of them have died. <laughs> so, well, in fact, what was the state of computing for businesses? Because what you and Ken were doing had to have been incredibly revolutionary. It's not like a lot of businesses. Well, the, 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 of the 650 came out in 1956, I believe. No, I programmed this. <laughs> there was a 604 plugboard programmed machine had gone into a lot of punch card installations. Yeah. And I programmed the 650 
at, at Ohio Oil Company in the summer of 55. Mm -hmm. So the 650 came out in 54, I think. Yeah. And it was very popular. Uh, it was the first machine to sell more than 1,000 <coughs> copies. What would it sell for? What would be a price of $2,000 a month. Wow. Rent. Wow. And programming was not unlike for the Mark IV. There weren't a lot of tools or anything. It was uh, decimal absolute. But yeah. because it was decimal, you know, I can tell you opcodes today. <laughs> tell me an 24 is store, distri <coughs> store distributor. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> That's remarkable. <laughs> Um, did you have any contact with the designers of that machine at all? Were you just I did later. Uh -huh. It turned out that Ernie Hughes, who yeah. was responsible for the Model 3360, yeah. was one of the design engineers on the 650 a decade before. before. Marvelous. Yeah. So then, after you graduated from, finished your your master or your doctorate, then you went on to IBM. But there's a personal story I want to come back to because I heard you say that shortly after you uh, defended your thesis, you connected again with that young lady that was born in the hospital well, back then. Well, we, we met the first Sunday night. We were at Harvard. Each of us were raised good Methodist churchmen, yep. even though neither of us was a converted Christian at the time. That happened later. But we both made our way to the Wesley Foundation facility <coughs> for Methodist students for Sunday night, and we met there that first Sunday night and had a three-year <coughs> three courtship over our stay at Harvard. Marvelous. Nancy, where had she uh, She had up? done uh, her undergraduate work in <coughs> physics. She had grown up in Durham, and then when World War II came along, her daddy went into the Navy, and they were <coughs> located in Patuxent Naval Beach and then in Washington. He's a mathematical statistician. and. <coughs> So he ended up in Washington. Um, so she went to high school in Washington, and they and they lived in Falls Church. So she went to the University of Rochester with a major in physics and a minor in music, and then went to Harvard and got a master's <coughs> master's in physics and did another year of music, and then we got married the Saturday after commencement on Thursday. We both went to IBM. She was working on transistor circuits for stretch, simulating the circuits with matrix calc calculations, and I was one of the stretch architects under Werner Buchholz. Big wedding, small wedding? Middle sized. No. And you just celebrated sure. your 50th wedding anniversary? Yes, last summer. summer. Fugitives from the laws of averages. Congratulations. <laughs> so, IBM, how is it you got the job there? Did, you, did they approach you? Did you approach them? Well, Steve Dunwell, who was project manager for Stretch, came, came through Harvard looking for people. And what he had to offer was very attractive. Here's a chance to work on the world's fastest computer. <laughs> and that sounded good to me, and so I leapt at the opportunity. An amazing opportunity for a husband-wife team to work on. Yes. Of, yeah. So your your wife was working on really the transistor <laughs> end of it. You were working on the, the architecture. architecture. Yeah. Who were some of the other architects you worked with? Well, Werner Buchholz was the boss of architecture. Uh, Jerry Blau, John Cott, uh, Dura Sweeney, um, John mm, name escapes me was part of the market planning group. He, he had a strong background in scientific computation. Harwood Kolsky, who with John devised Look Ahead, Instruction Look Ahead, as part of the stretch project. Harwood's background was Los Alamos. He was a theoretical physicist, computational, who had done part of the computations for <coughs> the H-bomb uh, tests. At so he was on the Manhattan Project. Wow. Right. He, so he worked with uh, Feynman and all those kind of folks, I'd imagine. So where were you in the beginning of, where was Stretch when you joined it? Has it had it just begun? Was it, it along it the was, way? It had been, the team doubled from 40 people to 80 people in July of 56. <coughs> and so they, they had been underway thinking about it about a year and had 
just signed the <coughs> the Los Alamos contract and had just signed the contract with the National Security Agency to build the harvest. Got it. And I was a t the o only one of the stretch architects proper who was native born and could be cleared to work on harvest. And so I was the go-between between the two architects. <coughs> between the two architecture groups. You needed a, 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 an above top secret clearance, you needed I'd a, imagine. A communications, intelligence, crypto clearance for, right. to work right. on right. harvest. So as the go-between, you then were responsible for looking at their requirements and feeding them in? or Well, and what, working, what on, working on some of the architecture for harvest. Got it. <coughs> so uh, Jim Pomerine was the engineering manager for harvest. George Kramer and Paul Hurwitz were two of the architects along with Jim and I worked on the real-time adjustments because Harvest is a streaming machine and you want to not stop. <laughs> is Harvest unclassified now? Harvest has been described in the literature. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so I can ask you these questions without getting into trouble. That's right, yes. <laughs> Good. And Harvest is now out of commission but it went for some 20 years. Wow. <laughs> what was Harvest's mission primarily? Uh, Breaking, breaking wired wheel crypto codes. Wow, so kind of <coughs> following along the path of what Colossus did. Oh, yes, yeah. And, and wow, th this is a path I hadn't expected. <coughs> Was there much influence from the work from Colossus and the folks at Oh, Bitcoin? the whole crypto community is very close-knit secret community, <coughs> especially between the British and the Americans. So there are hardly any secrets between those two. So did you have so a we, time? Yeah. I, I was assigned one stretch of six, <coughs> six week assignment in an essay working in their advanced development group wow. on algebraic techniques for wired wheel machines. <coughs> well, marvelous. So I'm trying to understand then the, the parallelism between that work and the stretch work. Did this happen? Har the Harvest time, was, a pl uh, was a plug in card for stretch. Oh, I see. <coughs> So Got Stretch it. was the host, yes, and it was about 15 feet long and five feet high and five feet deep. Yeah. Harvest was the plug-in card. It added another 20 feet yep. of <laughs> 20 feet <laughs> of specialized electronics. Marvelous! <laughs> so it's a wonderful machine. I mean, the whole concept is is just radically different. So what makes it so wonderful? You, you speak with almost a, a dreamy passion about. Oh it. yeah. You can think of it as having two conveyor belts <laughs> and they come together into a logic unit yes. and then a conveyor belt goes back to the memory. And at the end of each of these conveyor belts is a small boy who takes things out of memory according to, <laughs> to quite complicated patterns and puts them on the belt. And going back in, there's another small boy that puts things back in memory in quite small yes. and quite <laughs> complicated patterns. In addition to the logic unit, which is one byte wide, does all the Boolean things plus addition, subtraction. Uh, there's a table lookup, a streaming table lookup, that allows you to take an arbitrary base, shift some collection of bytes in to make up an address, go to memory, and either count in memory or in memory, or bring back from memory a chunk of stuff which then gets extracted and put on the conveyor belt. And this thing ran about four million bytes a second. All this going, and it, and it would take a half day to write an instruction for it. It had about 250 bytes of instruction to set it up. You can think of it as an electronic plug board if you want to think of it that way. How many harvests were actually built? One. Just the one. <laughs> Interesting. And it was used, you said, for 20 years? Yeah, something like that. Amazing. So, and, it, and it had a very powerful tape, <coughs> tape system. You used wide tapes with automatic robots fishing them out and mounting them to keep the data flowing. Way ahead of its time. And Way ahead of its time. Wow. So, so it's, more, it's more like today's graphics processors as a, <coughs> as a streaming machine than it is like anything else today. So back on the stretch then, what are you most proud of in your contributions to stretch architecture? Uh, the notion of going from a hardware console to a programmable console, <coughs> Progr operating system driven console. That was so that we could have multiple programs. The stretch 
But Stretch's big contribution was all the supervisory facilities to enable multiprogramming mm -hmm. and to enable you to keep your programs apart. And the, I, I, Dura Sweeney and I had to patent on the interrupt system. It was not the first interrupt system. Univac 1103 had that, but ours was the first one that had maskable and vector, vector, <coughs> vectoring interrupts in that. Right. And so that and the programmable console, I was responsible for the instruction sequencing chunk of the, of the architecture. And so this was sort of, the, sort of the era of the rise of the machines in which there was a lot of experimentation. Oh, yes, and we made our share of mistakes. But the purpose of Stretch was to make the fast, <coughs> fastest machine we could cost no object. And that's v both liberating and tempting. And uh, we were... Did you succeed <coughs> in that goal? No. Uh, Dunwell had set out to make a machine 100 times the 704, yes. but the memories available were only six times the 704. The circuits were about 10 times the <coughs> 704. And the idea was by using more of everything, we could get there, and you can't. It turns out that with a memory bandwidth like, <coughs> like that, you can't do it. So we got to 50 times. It was declared a disaster and withdrawn from the market at 13. <coughs> Nine of them were built, I guess. Yep. And uh, later then, uh, they re <coughs> recognized that it was the thing that, in the first place, the tech stretch technology enabled the 7090, 7080, 7084, <coughs> 7074. And in the second place, the concepts became crucial for the 360. And so Tom, Tom Watson, to his credit, went back and uh, got Steve Dunwell out of disgrace and made a special award to him, recognizing <laughs> the important influence the stretch had had on, on the company's welfare. And where were you doing this work? Poughkeepsie. <coughs> okay, Poughkeepsie. Yeah. And, uh, wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So it, it, it was to Tom Watson's credit, because this was, <laughs> this was a, a leap of faith he took for this project. Oh, yes. To proceed. And then, so, Stretch, you know, then wound down. Where did IBM find you next? I went to the research division in Yorktown, and I, I worked on this book some. The, the book being... Uh, the no, computer. not that book, oh, but the book. Automatic Data oh, Processing the one 360 edition. Okay, <coughs> yes. Ken and I had done the 650 edition, and then right. he was kind of fully occupied with APL, so... I did most of the 360 edition of automatic data processing. Right. <coughs> in fact, to set it in historical time, when was Ken working on APL? When did it? Oh, that start, uh, started at Harvard in the course. Oh, okay. When we were doing the automatic data processing course, he started looking for ways to descri describe sorting mathematically. He was a mathematician by nature and by training. And he found that there were many av <coughs> available notations, but they were inconsistent with each other. So he undertook to develop a consistent notation that would serve. And here's the kind of problem you encounter. In ordinary algebra, <coughs> the, the letters represent variables, and the numbers represent data. In machine pro programming, the addresses the names are, le are numbers, and the contents are letters. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> the reverse. And so you have to start think thinking in much more general terms. And Ken did a magnificent job of fashioning APL as a think <coughs> thinking language yes. with a complete freedom to use any characters you please as a thinking language. Then later, when it went to be mechanizable, the character set <coughs> was a great handicap, and he later developed the J language that uses standard standard character set. Did you ever write much uh, APL programs? Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, sure. Very good. It's very powerful. It is. Uh, oh, I once did a pension calculation for Methodist Conference between supper and bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> all in APL. For, all in APL. For <laughs> Marvelous. Work, doing actuarial work for 150 retired pastors. <laughs> so, so back in your tent, who was the lab, man, uh, lab director back then? Do you remember? John Gibson was lab uh -huh. director in Yorktown when I and the labs hadn't been around that long, had they? Oh, the big lab at Yorktown wasn't built. We went to Mahansic facility at 
where US 6 <coughs> crosses the Taconic. What other researchers were there at that time? I mean, IBM has about 3,000 researchers, but <coughs> you were much smaller back at that time. Probably. Oh, I, I can't. Hundreds. I can't. Yeah, it was a, the division, the research division had been in the 701 building. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Stretch was in the research division when I joined the company, oh. and then it got moved to the product, <coughs> product development division after the first year. And so going back to research was a natural for me and for John Cock. And John and I joined the company the same day, July 10, 56. And John had his PhD from Duke, so we quickly became there friends. You go. Yeah. Did you have much contact with Tom Watson back then? Or did he just swing oh, no. by the labs I'm, occasionally? Yeah. And yeah. Tom Watson <coughs> Sr. would come through the labs. Oh. Yeah. Any memories of Tom Watson Sr. at all? Well, there was this wonderful tale, I didn't see it, of him going down the all in the research lab and encountering this tall Scotsman who was wearing his kilt. And Mr. Watson Sr. turned to the lab manager and said, get some pants on that man. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so there, there was a, a, a pretty strict dress code and kilts apparently didn't fit. It didn't fit. <laughs> kilts and ties. <laughs> so you remember wearing ties and, and white White shirts back then. I oh yeah. <laughs> so then the 360 came to be. How did? Well, there's a long story there. Yeah, <coughs> there is. While I was in research, the data systems division, which was the middle of the market up in compu <coughs> computers, recognized they had a product line problem. They had the 7090 line, <coughs> the 7080 line, the 7074 line, the 1410 line. And so um, Charles DiCarlo, who was vice president for engineering, appointed a committee to study what a successor product line architecture might look like. I chaired that committee on loan from research. It was called the May Day Committee because we were due to report the 1st of May. In what year would this have been? Well, let's see. The year I was in research must have been, <coughs> must have been 60, 60, May of, May of 60. <coughs> uh, meanwhile, Jerry was working on a machine called the 70AB, which in, was a business data processing machine up a middle range incorporating a lot of stretch concepts. The Had stretch gone out of production by then? <coughs> It was out of the lab, it was still in production, and it was being manufactured in Kingston. Copies went, you know, France, England, sure. a lot of places. <coughs> uh, and f from this came the co <coughs> concept that we needed a new product line for the data systems division. <coughs> So at the end of the summer, I was asked to come back to the Data Systems Division to Poughkeepsie as manager of architecture parallel to Don Pendry, <coughs> who was manager of engineering. It was functionally organized at that point. And we then undertook to design a new product line, which was called the 8000 series, built, built around stretch concepts as reflected in the 70AB, and the 70AB would be our first engineering model because it was up and Larry Cantor was engineering manager for that particular machine. It was coming along great. Larry had been one of the inventors and engineers of the channel, the notion of an independent I.O. processor running on a business data processing machine. Very good engineer. So we designed this 8000 8, series consisting of a small binary computer, a small uh, side, that was scientific, uh, uh, a small business machine, this middle size 70 AB, and then a grown up version of that for high performance things like insurance companies and utilities, and uh, a grown up version for scientific computing, 8108. And then we worked very hard on that, and in uh, January of 61, 
we had zero level cost estimates and zero level market forecasts, had a marketing plan that involved creating new market by making these machines communications oriented. Okay, because we had, you don't eat your own business. <coughs> Just replace them, because most of our business was rental business. And you don't make any money displacing your own rental machines. So had to do something that would create new computer applications, and we saw communications as <laughs> the way to go. So the question I was asking is back to the May Day Committee in terms of you know its size, and I think you said there were about <laughs> six people, and you got selected because I think you said you were in research and and I was available. I <laughs> were available, but you said while you were in research, there were a number of things you were doing that sounded fascinating. Yes, I was. Uh, whenever I wasn't doing anything else, I was working on the automatic data processing 360 edi edition book. <coughs> but one assignment was six weeks at the National Security Agency. Uh, they had <coughs> asked IBM to assign some of their people into their research division so that IBM would have some in-house competence in the crypto field because IBM had built them a lot of special pur <coughs> purpose machines and would again. <coughs> So I was one of a group of people assigned one after another into that. And you were assessing the Soviet? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, that was was that later? This was, this was purely a crypto, <coughs> crypto assignment. And <coughs> that was when I learned about this whole inside literature community, the, oh. the st <coughs> stuff that Turing had done on the Enigma, all yeah. that has since been declassified. Then another time, I was assigned four weeks to the executive office of the pre <coughs> president. This was in the Eisenhower administration. And uh, the Cold War was raging. Yes, and I was in Washington when Khrushchev came to town. Oh, my. And saw the parade. And I thought I would never live to see that. That, that was just incredible. So you saw Khrushchev from a distance? <coughs> when I was standing at the curb, and the car was going down the road to Blair House. Yeah, I mean, th that kind wow. of distance. And I was in the executive office building one, one day on this assignment when the word came, everybody come over to the White House. Uh, Eisenhower is seeing Winston Churchill off after his <coughs> last visit. And so we all came over and stood on the lawn. And here, here came these two old cronies who had been through so much together. Churchill was in his 80s and was clearly feeble. And you could, had no trouble imagining that this was the last time they would see each other. One of the things that surprised me was that Ike stood a head taller than everybody else on the lawn. Okay, I just had not been aware of that. <clears throat> but it was a very moving, you know, there were maybe 150 of us from the executive office building and the White House staff <coughs> say, saying goodbye to him. So that, was, that assignment was to the President's Science Advisory Committee. Uh, Kistiakowski was President's <coughs> Science Advisor at the time. And I reported to them after the study of the materials the CIA had collected, which included a lot of open literature material, a lot of newspaper <coughs> clippings, a lot of interview reports from American scientists who had been to, on tours of the Soviet Union and a lot of uh, material that was gathered by communications intel <coughs> intelligence methods, and that was why. And surprisingly enough, the, the person on the President's Science Advisory Committee who had the best and most penetrating <coughs> questions, by the time I reported it was the Kennedy administration. I remember my shock when I went back to Washington and hear all this playground equipment set up on the White House, White House lawn <coughs> for Kennedy's kids. And uh, was uh, Ed Land, the founder of Polaroid. He had much the most penetrating questions. Not a computer person at all, but a great mind. And he, uh, I was very impressed. He never finished college either. He's one who, who quit Harvard. So you can probably talk about it now, but <laughs> what was your assessment of the state? Of they the were state about seven state? years behind uh -huh. in all respects. Mm -hmm. Software, hardware, everything. Everything. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. And, well, that, and that had been true. I tracked it over some years, and, <coughs> and the lag had been pretty constant. Uh -huh. 
So, wow, fascinating assignment. So let's. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is amazing. And then stuff. another one was yeah. a group, of, a group of us were assigned to go out on what's called a 438L contract to look at the intelligence processing at the Strategic Air <coughs> Command Underground in Omaha. So we went out and spent a week watching how the briefing was done, how the intelligence was processed in the <coughs> subroom in the underground where the, the, the commanding general had his general brief on logistics and operations <coughs> and personnel and so forth, and then he retired to the tank and got a little briefing just on intelligence. And they were using our machines for the <coughs> for processing that data and needed some advice. Wow. Well, what did you advise them on? What did you suggest, if you can I, say? I, I, I don't remember, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so then this brings us back to, uh, you were, we were talking around 1961 time frame then, when things were really... In January, we yeah. presented the 8,000 series <coughs> in a... Uh, what we call the Winter Carnival. It was an all-day thing. We had to brass up from our <coughs> our mark in White Plains, and we went through the forecast. We went through the estimates. We went through the performance figures. <coughs> we went through the communications uh, attachment concepts. The what we saw is this is creating new market because you could really run ter <coughs> terminals and <coughs> things like banking and so forth. Tele teleprocessing was the term invented at that time for the purpose. Yeah. Was that a mark an IBM marketing term or a term out in the atmosphere or somebody? It was an IBM, or, oh, IBM marketing term. Okay. Okay. And the uh, the whole program was very well received, except for one fellow sitting in the back who just got <coughs> glummer looking as the day went on, and that was Vin Learson. And that's not who you want to get glummer as the day went on, because he was executive vice president of the company. <laughs> well, that night he fired my boss. He didn't. He uh, Max Femmer. He shipped him out to Colorado, Boulder, to out of Siberia to work on tapes. He brought in Bob Evans from Endicott from the other division, because this was our division's plan. He told Bob if it's <laughs> look into it. If it's right, make it happen. If it's wrong, turn it around. Bob spent three weeks looking into it, took me out to dinner at a fish place in Poughkeepsie and told me he had decided it was wrong <laughs> and was going to turn it around. And, I, and it was his plan. His plan was to do, we were losing market. We were, we were obsolete. Who were you losing market share primarily to? The Seven Dwarfs. Uh -huh. And uh, everybody. Everybody was out after us. We were, we were fundamentally a dress size limited. We couldn't attach more memory to the 7090. We couldn't attach more memory to the 7080. And the applications were hungry for more memory. So <clears throat> the problem was that he, pro he proposed to wait for a new semi-integrated circuit technology that was going to be three years down the road. And the uh, problem is, how do you hold the market in the meantime? Whereas I had a plan that would get out there now. It had some fundamental difficulties, and he was right and I was wrong. But we fought for six months. And at one point, at the end of February, he called me up and he said, Fred, I want you to know you got a raise. And I said, I was quite surprised. I said, Bob, <laughs> thank you. He said, I want you to know I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a silly question, if you don't mind, let me ask you a personal one. What did IBM or get back then in the 60s? What was a, huh? what was a typical salary back in the 60s? Oh, no, I don't know. IBM or? Well, when I left, I was in the 20s. Yep. Yeah. Matter of fact, after the 360 came out, Tom Watson Jr. called for our pay cards for Gene and Jerry and me and Bob, and he said, do you mean we've bet the company on people we don't pay any more than this? And we got, we got instant $10,000 a year raises. Straight from Tom. Straight from Tom, <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's marvelous. So <coughs> I, I want to go back to the heads rolling from uh, the, the one gentleman being fired. What no, was, he, he was exiled. Oh, he was exiled. Yeah, okay. transferred to... A, he was given a managerial job at the Boulder Laboratory. He was just 
not in the main line of where the action was. Got it. Interesting. Let, let me also understand the state of the Seven Dwarves in programming back then, because we also saw then the rise of some of the higher order programming languages. Yes. And this is around the time of Fortran and, and COBOL and the like as well, too. Right. <clears throat> Did you ever run across uh, uh, John uh, Bacchus? Oh, or, yes, or, sure. Uh, uh -huh. when, I, when I was in research, yeah. I knew Bacchus and his team because yeah. they were working on Fortran. Right. Matter of fact, I had been impressed with Fortran, which came out when I was a graduate student, uh, <laughs> 50, winter of 56. Yep. And that, you know, Fortran, Fortran 1 was a marvelous accomplishment <laughs> because John understood that to break the uh, whole assembly language had, he had to have running time <coughs> that were competitive with best assembly coding. Didn't matter how long it took to compile for that market, for that big scientific market. And <coughs> so a Fortran compilation would take 20 or 30 minutes, but then you ran production for 40 hours, and so, and so the optimiz <coughs> optimizations, that, that team of uh, that John had put together was really brilliant and did a <coughs> phenomenal job on Fortran. Did you have much uh, interaction with him professionally at all uh, while at the labs? Mm. I tried to keep up with what they yeah, were doing, yeah. but but yeah. I was doing machine architecture and Got it. he was doing compiler. Got it. Got it. So you said earlier that you know your your boss was <coughs> right and you were wrong. In what way? And what oh, was that? he had two. He had two, two, two parts of the vision. One was, and this, one was we ought not to do a new product line for the data systems division. We ought to do a new product line for the IBM company, big, <coughs> big and little. And he was right, and I was wrong. The other was that we ought to make the new product line coincide with the new technology. <coughs> and the reason that was right was the. 70 AB, then rechristened the 8106, used the same memories the 7, <coughs> 7090 used. Now, by this time, these memories were coining pure gold. The margin on them must have been 85, 90 percent profit because the, the manufacturing engineering had gotten down to they could make these core memories. <coughs> and so the pricing people told us, well, look, to come out with a system profit margin that's appropriate, we'll take it off on the processor and get it back on the memories. But it turned out that if you went through that exercise, <coughs> you needed a negative price on the processor. And you, you don't pay people to haul your processors away. So that, that was a fundamental flaw in building a second generation technology new product line. Now, Bob didn't understand that then, and I, <coughs> I didn't either, but it came clear in the, in the ensuing fights. And we fought back and forth, and we went to <coughs> the Corporate Management Committee in March, and I won, and that didn't slow Bob down a bit. Bob, Bob's unstoppable. And so he, we fought on some more, and he went to the Corporate Management Committee in May, and he won, and that was over. And then uh, this meant stopping all the projects <coughs> in the Poughkeepsie lab. I mean, they were all 8,000 series projects. And reassigning all the people, and his plan was to do temporizing machines, the 7 <coughs> 7094, the 7080 Model 3, et cetera, et cetera, to hold the market as best we could <coughs> until we could get there with the new product line, with the new technology. And so all these engineers had to be reassigned to these temporizing machines. Max Paley was in charge of the temporizing <coughs> machines. And to my utter amazement, Bob asked me to take the new product line. I had gone to, he, he had a retreat up at Sarasota Springs to spend a week <coughs> ironing out who's going to do what. And I had gone to make sure my boys landed on their feet in the reassignment, but I was I was going back to research. I, I was on the way out. And Thursday of that week, he asked me to take the crown jewels. And uh, I was dubious. We had been fighting pretty hard. 
But I went and talked to Jerry Haddad, who was Bob's boss at the time, and Jerry <coughs> had been engineering manager for the 701, and Bob had been an engineer on that. And Jerry said, well, Fred, I never knew anybody regretted working for Bob Evans. So I thought, all right, I'll give that a, give that a try. We'll give it a go and see how it goes. And it went really well. And we clicked, and we, we fought shoulder to shoulder, side by side, the rest of the way. And Bob, Bob is one of four great bosses I had Who in the my life. Three? Aiken, uh -huh. Tom Watson, even though he was not my direct boss, and Sam Williamson, who was dean at Carolina and later president of uh, the university, <coughs> university of the South. So it sounds like the way Somewhere. you, the, the reason you and Bob clicked so well is, I mean, you both had a, a professional yet uh, adversarial <laughs> relationship in the sense that you could, you, you we were respected to speak each other. the truth to each other. That's power. right, and, yeah. and we respected each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Adversarial <laughs> is too negative, but you, you wouldn't. Oh, you we, were fighting. we were fighting. We were fighting. It was adversarial. <laughs> We were advocating different product yeah. strategies, and product fights in big corporations are major. They are indeed. And we and e <coughs> each of us was swearing in all the friends we had from all the divisions, and he had friends that went, I mean, folks like Clarence Frizzell, who wasn't, had no official position in this decision <coughs> at all, but was a very influential figure in the company. He was running a factory somewhere, but, you know. So the fraternity system, and uh, affects things. So about. true. So what resources did he give you to proceed with your job? He said, you know, Fred, go forth and do this. Well, and then come August, it was, this happened in early June, come August it was time to come in with annual budgets. And Max came in, I think, with uh, a $12 million <coughs> budget for the next gen. Bob cut it to 10. And I came in with 9.6 and got every penny of it. Mm. Now, Max was famous for <coughs> padding his budgets, and mine was honest. And apparently that was detected. And uh, but so once, once, <coughs> once I saw him give me the resources, and he said he would go get the people. All right, so I had draft, <coughs> and he brought in a first-class engineering manager, Pete Fagg from Endicott, and uh, to to work for me as my engineering manager. And so we, uh, we started at work. Well, then the spread committee, Don Spaulding stimulated <coughs> Learson with this idea of having a corporate-wide thing. The problem is John Hanstron, the 1401, which was doing great, and <coughs> Hanstron wasn't eager to do anything to upset his market. <coughs> so they made Hanstron the head of the spread committee in the hopes of co-opting him. But halfway through that, John, who was engineering manager of the, of the general products division, got promoted to be a division manager, and so he had to go off the spread committee. And from then on, <coughs> we were uh, John was an adversary to the 360 project all the way through until the final shootout in January of '64. Interesting. So, what did that nine plus million buy you in terms of resources? How was that kind of spread apart in terms of the hardware, software, people side of things? Oh. That was at at that point. It was all hardware. We did we we had a small programming. I had uh, Paul Herwitz and George Grover on my team as program <coughs> product planners to figure out what we ought to be doing. But then there was a big program in house that was supporting all these interim mm. machines. Yes. Okay, <coughs> so uh, SOS was going along great at the scientific side. There was Autocoder and all these things on the commercial side, COBOL. Ever run across Grace Murray Hopper? Ever, ever oh, yes. Right matter of fact, I rode across. Grace visited us in Ch <coughs> pardon me, at Harvard occasionally in Chapel Hill. She came and gave a lecture series for us, and I rode across the continent with her uh, on the airplane once because uh, she hired my first two PhD students, as a matter of fact, to work on in her, her office in the Pentagon after she went back as admiral. I still have my nanosecond from Grace. Uh, yes, I have my nanosecond. <laughs> <laughs> what a fine lady she was. Okay, back to the 360. What, what was the, a couple of lines of questions here. What was the first <coughs> major internal milestone you guys met for which you could say, 
you know, I'm confident we're going to actually pull this off. <coughs> oh, law. That's, that's too involved. Okay. What happened architecturally yes. was we had started out in the data systems division pursuing an, a sta stack architecture. And we, which is what Burroughs had done. Which is what Burroughs, Burroughs had done. Yeah. Oh. Turns out that works great if you've got a register, of, a real show enough transistor register for several levels, and it doesn't work great if you've got it all in memory and you're having to pull it and push it and pull it and push it. <laughs> so when we started, after the spread report came in in December of 61, then we face the question of now making a whole whole product line with this architecture. We had accepted the assignment of making it upward and downward compatible. One one architecture. Now let me go back to that decision, if I may. Uh, who who made that decision? Was that yours? Was that your boss? Was that Bob's? To just come out. I don't know whether Bob thought it, thought it up or whether Spalding suggested it. Spalding was very smart. But, and so, in the spread committee, Bob, oh, Gene and I were kind of the chief architects. John Fairclough from Ursley was the, th the third one who was professional architect <coughs> and engineer. And uh, later, Sir John, a, a really wonderful person. Uh, so Bob said, this is what we want to do, and can we do it? Gene and I said, not, uh, not evident, looks hard. And the problem is addressing. If you put addresses big enough on your littlest machine, your littlest machine is serial by byte, and that means you spend a lot of cycles fetching address bytes that you're never going to use, and that clobbers your performance. And so the stack architecture was a way of addressing that by not fetching as many addresses. But it turned out that when we went through the performance and cost estimation cycle in March of 62, the stack machines worked fine from the middle up, but they didn't work. They weren't competitive down below because of all this push reflecting things in and out of memory. So we scrapped it and had a design competition, which was an idea Gene suggested. And we said, you can form internal teams as you please, and I think there were 12, 12 or 13 teams, mostly three or four people, in the architecture group. And I said, the decision of the judge will be final. And it turned out that <coughs> Gene's team and Jerry's team came in with essentially the same concept which was used base registers that Philco had introduced in a machine a year or so earlier. <laughs> because the base registers meant that we could get by with short addresses and expand them in the in the registers. And that got us over the hardest technical problem of downward compatibility. There is one very big difference, and that is Gene's machine was based on a 6-bit byte and multiples of that, so 24-bit instructions, 48-bit floating point words, so forth. And Jerry's machine was based on an 8-bit byte and 32-bit instructions, 64-bit and 32-bit floating point, which is not a real happy choice, but it's one. There are strong arguments each, <coughs> each way. And uh, and you want your architecture to be consistent. You're not going to have an 8-bit byte and 48-bit instruct <coughs> floating point word. <coughs> and so then came the biggest internal fight, and that was between the 6 and 8-bit byte. And that story's been told. And, and uh, Gene and I each quit once that week and quit the company. <laughs> and Manny Peori got us back together, and we went off. He was a senior scientist in the company, and he, a person of <coughs> great wisdom, great wisdom. And the 8-bit bike prevailed. Yes, I had made that decision, and Gene had appealed it to Bob, and Bob yes. con 
confirmed it. And uh, of all my technical accomplishments, making the 8-bit byte decision is far and away the most important. Because, be, and the reason was to open the lowercase alphabet. Because I saw, I saw language pro <coughs> processing as being another whole new market area that we weren't in and couldn't get into very well as long as we were doing six-bit character sets. So the design decisions that really shaped the beginning of this, we, we can enumerate. We flushed the stacks, yep. <coughs> went to the base registers, yep. and went to the 8-bit byte. Yep. And uh, the fact that you'd have the same instruction set architecture from top to bottom. Oh, oh, that was made in the spread committee. Oh yes. Uh, okay. What what we said was, look, we don't we don't know whether we can do that or not. Yeah. yeah. But we'll go try to do that, and we'll come back and tell you whether we have break the architecture into two two fragments or three, <coughs> or whether we can do it. Yeah. And so we went off to do it, and it turned out with the base registers we could do it. Yeah. And so we didn't break it. No. So, now the 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 model twenty is a subset. Model twenty is not a is not a perfect three hundred and sixty. But it's a proper subset. It is a proper subset. Yeah. So, tell me one or two decisions that you regret having made, if there are any. Well, the one that we knew we were doing wrong, but we couldn't see how to to pay for it that far ahead <laughs> was in the input output control word limiting the address sizes so that we could get the, all, all the information <laughs> in one control word <clears throat> and we knew we would outgrow that matter of fact we published a paper in 65 that said we will have to go to 32 bit addresses from 24 <laughs> during the life of this product but we can't do it now because it would have and uh, what the one that we did just by mistake, just overlooked, was Branch and Link, mm -hmm. which uses the high order eight bits of an address to st stash data in, and when you go to a 32-bit address, that's the only place in the whole, you have the out of control words, but we knew we had <coughs> would have that problem when we went, finally went to 32-bit addresses. But Branch and Link was just a goof. Interesting. The other, the other thing that I would, The SS format for character processing. We had a choice of do we go with a fixed word decimal format, 650 style, or we knew we needed this kind of a variable length format for character processing. The question of whether you do the decimal that way or whether you do the decimal more fixed than the style of your fixed point binary. That was a toss up, and it might have been needed to go the other way, but. Uh, on the other hand, you have you have some anomalies that you don't get the full indexing in the SS format. So, in the life of the beginning of this project, this was you know really down at the hardware level of, of architectural decisions. When did the software elements of the project begin creeping in and start dominating? Where did that fit in the life cycle? Well, in in 62, we formulated the, a plan to have four software levels, known as Romans 1, 2, 3, 4. And they were fundamentally, because we had hardware compatib <coughs> compatibility, the software levels only had to be distinguished by memory size. And that, and McWhorter, who was the division president, took the software away from us and put it in his software house that was doing the software for the makeshifts, the, for the market, <coughs> market holders. Well, they were busy, and they didn't give the 360 software much attention. So by the end of 63, we had definitions for Ro <coughs> Romans 2, 3, and 4, maybe Roman 1 as well, but it was a mess. It was an awful mess. And so, in January of 64, we had the final shootout with Hanstra, in which we got the go-ahead to do the 360. 
<coughs> and that was a little technical tour de force by three bright engineers who overnight came up with the 1401 emulation on the on the Model 30. Remember overnight. Their names? Yes, Bill Wright, Bill Hanf, and Jerry Ottaway. Overnight. Yeah. Well, we had this meeting in in White Plains. And Hanster was saying, I've got this 1401S. It's made of the 360 technology. It's six times faster than the 1401. It's the same price as the 1401. I've got more than 10,000 machines out there. And the biggest single revenue producer that I own that I can. And, and uh, Honeywell is trying to eat me with this Liberator. And, OK. Meeting. So. I, I had Bill and Jerry Ottaway were my technical cavalry that were sent. They were real bright engineers and would dispatch to wherever the trouble was. They had later <gasps> went to Germany, well, earlier and done the Model 20. Okay. Uh, so we got on the airplane and flew to Endicott. Bill Hanf was kind of the Model 30's representative on the architectural team, a real smart lad. And so he was resident there and knew the microcoding backwards and forwards. And so I brought them coffee and encouraged them all night. And we decided, you know, which of the central, central loop and typical operations that would make up a performance mix, we had to have the microcode fully detailed for. And next morning, we had a machine that was four times the 1401 and could switch back and forth between being a 1401 and a, and, a, and a 360. Well, the Model 30 already switched back and forth between being a three, <coughs> 360 processor, a selector channel, and a 256-way multiplexer channel. And so the notion that one implementation <coughs> can take on multiple architectures was an insight Jerry had had some years earlier that was just crucial to our thinking. And that one architecture can have many implementations was crucial to our thinking. And so I went back to White Plains and brought in these results. And yes, it's not six times a 1401, but the customer can start by running his 1401 programs, not have to convert a single thing, <laughs> and bit by bit code new applications or reconvert old ones to the 360 and get into next generation instead of the last one. Well, that had an <coughs> impact, but I still didn't know how things were going to be. Next morning, I went back to the political meeting, and Hanster wasn't there. He had, he had sent his engineering manager instead. I knew we'd won. <coughs> and sure enough, the John Opal representing the whole marketing force had come in overnight and said, this is what we got to have. And so, but look, this is three months before announcement and the whole program is hanging in balance because <laughs> what Hanster said was you do all of it except the Model 30. Yeah. All right, we'll just, take the, we'll just take the 1401. Of course, we'll take the chips. <laughs> and we'll take that big chunk of your forecast. Yeah. All right. Three months before, three months before announcement, that, that, it was hanging in the balance. That's pretty tough. That was pretty, <coughs> pretty tough. But we knew then that we that, that we were going to make it. That yeah. was that was the first time we knew for sure we were going to make it. So give me your memories of the announcement. Uh, it happened in New York, I presume. It happened in Poughkeepsie first, and then no, it happened in New York first, and then. Uh, then we drove to Poughkeepsie, and then we did it again, essentially, essentially for a press corps there. I had a sharp earache come on that day. I remember that vividly. One of these inflamed things that you have to have lanced. Yeah. But uh, it was a glorious day. It was a glorious day in New York. It was a glorious day in Poughkeepsie. April the 7th, 1964. It was picked to be the seventh to, to match the Mark I, August 7th, 1944. Interesting. So was Tom Watson there? Oh, indeed. And he, so he, did, he, he did the pitch. 
And you were sitting in the background, or? Oh, I helped. I mean, yeah, each of you, you several right. of us had something right. to say. And what was your feeling then, you know, toward the end, as you realized, wow, we've really done something pretty amazing here? Could you sense that? Well, from the reaction of the press. <laughs> the thing I said to my team is. Tonight, the lights will be on in the other guy's offices. <laughs> <laughs> you think you took them by surprise, the other drawers, the seven? It had been kept pretty well secret. Yeah. Not quite, but, yeah. but pretty well. It had been surprisingly few leaks. Yeah. And then the order started pouring in. And then the order started pouring in. Meanwhile, the software was in real trouble. Yeah. The Roman plan was not working. And so I said to Bob, look, the machines are being released to the factory. The hardware part is done. The, the road to announcement, the data processing division is rolling on. Since McWhorter won't roll the two together, let me go over and leave the hardware part and go work on the software and try to s I was already scheduled to go to Chapel Hill in September. Bob and I knew that, that, and that, I don't know when we told the public that, but I think it was, it, it wasn't until about announcement, but he and I knew that. So you, in effect, you were ready to move on from IBM? I had accepted the job in Chapel Hill the previous August. Well, why Chapel Hill, I'm curious. Well, that's a long story, but <clears throat> and I won't go into it, sure. but I had in the meantime become a Christian yes. and the Lord was leading in very clear, not easy to explain ways. Yes. This was something that back the summer we were married, I had plotted out four possible career paths. University technical, university administrative, industry technical, industry administrative. Mm -hmm. So industry technical is your job, IBM fellow. Industry administrative is the vice president kind of yeah. thing. And similarly in the university, a dean or, right. you know, or just a professor, which is yeah. my job. Okay. I had asked myself and Nancy and I had discussed what do we, the, all four of these are attractive endpoints. Being newly married and Methodist, I'd ruled out being Pope. And lacking the talents, I'd ruled out being President and then just come up with these four end, end points. <coughs> what do we do to keep the options open? We came to two conclusions that governed our lives. One was we would live on an academic salary. And so we lived on Nancy's salary and banked mine. And we did that for years until she quit, and then we lived on what had been her salary with normal progression. And that meant that when I had the opportunity to go to Chapel Hill at half salary, I, we were, well, discipline had bought freedom. We were free to make that choice. It was not a change of standard of living, and moreover, there was money enough to put down more than half on a house, all right? <coughs> the other decision was that to, to keep the academic option open, one has to maintain a publication program. And the IBM company encouraged publication in principle, but they didn't make any time available for it in practice. And so, I, uh, when something like the interrupt system, did a paper in Fall Joint Computer Conference on when there weren't anything that we could talk about fresh out, did review papers, you know, yes. review of I.O. systems of computers and things like that. So that when the, uh, when the opportunity in Chapel Hill came up, I had a, a, a acceptable professional record for an appointment as full professor. Right. And, and that was bought with weekend labor and night labor over sure. the years too. Sure. And the, uh, The opportunity in Chapel Hill came about this way. The head of the computer center left to go to Pennsylvania, and they had a UNIVAC, and so they went to UNIVAC and said, find us one. 
Well, UNIVAC didn't want to tap any of their people for that kind of job, but they had an alumnus who was working for IBM, and they went to him. Well, that was George Kramer. He was a, then a harvest architect, and he had been Nancy's father's roommate in graduate school at the University of Missouri. A small world, they were both mathematicians. And so George said, well, I'm not interested in that job, but I know a young man that might be. He had known Nancy since before she was born. They had, George and Daddy Greenwood had been close all along. And so, this was the summer of 62. I went down, we went down, interviewed for the job, and it was, you know, it was April and the grass was green and the dogwood and flowering cherries were in bloom and the lakes up north were frozen and the old muddy snow was all over everywhere. But the job didn't fit. It just didn't fit. And so I declined, and we sadly trudged back north. My people were still living in North Carolina. That was an important attraction for my kids to grow up knowing their grandparents. But as part of the interview process, one gives a lecture, and the lecture I chose was 10 research topics in computer science, arguing that there should be a discipline, and there wasn't. Okay. And so, since there wasn't anybody, the, the heads of the departments that used the computation center all turned out for the le candidate's lecture. And the dean of the graduate school, who was professor of Southern literature, Hugh Holman, assembled a committee after I'd gone back to study the question of whether Carolina should have a computer science department. And they came back to me a year later and said, would you be interested in coming and talking about starting a computer science department? Now, that's summer of 63. Well, that's a different proposition. And these, <coughs> these elders of the several scientific departments were all for it. And so you felt this immense feeling of support getting off the ground. And I, that was when, after a lot of prayer and guidance, I accepted the job. And then I went and told Bob, and we agreed that lame ducks in industry don't have long half-life, we would keep it secret for the year until appropriate. So this was August of 63, and the announcement was due in April of 64, and I was due to go to Chapel Hill in September of 64. Wow. Hard decision to, to move on to lead the software side of things where you had this uh, opportunity to go to Chapel Hill, and on the Chapel well, Hill side for a moment. That was kept secret for the longest time. That was kept secret for a long time. How did, how did IBM and you manage to keep it secret with all the that we go about? Well, Bob and I knew, and I guess he told a few of his bosses, but generally we didn't tell people. Wow. Now, the word got out in UNIVAC, mm. and uh, I remember a UNIVAC person coming up to him at a conference and saying, I hear you're going to Chapel Hill. I said, well, where would you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Your daughter was saying, maybe I'm a little off on the time here, you even had a house in Chapel Hill. Oh, yes. Well, no, that... Was that a little later? The house was bought after, when we still thought we were going in fall of 64. Yep. But, yes, that's a little, little, little later. A little we later. bought it in the spring of 64. So it must have been a tough decision to say... It was, yeah. I'm going to go down the software path. Yeah. Well, no, the tough decision was to go to Chapel Hill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but look, it's February. Yeah. Announcements in April. The machines are on the track. Yeah. Everything's rolling. The software is in an utter mess. Yeah. So I went to Bob and I said, between now and September when I leave, yeah. let me go over there and bail yeah. and just see what can be done with the boat. So we changed the team. Some projects were ending up, like the 70... Uh, well, one of the operating systems, the 1410, 7 to 10, our disk based operating system. The first, Ted Codd had built a disk based operating system for Stretch. Mm -hmm. And that, he was working for me. I had inherited him when I took over the architecture job in DSD. And so I sent him to, to school to get his PhD, which was the other wisest thing I ever did, was <coughs> after he finished the Stretch operating system. <clears throat> that was not the operating system delivered with Stretch. There was an official one, and then Ted was doing this research project in a multi, 
programming, I think the first multi-programming operating system running. But then we had this, so I changed teams and we had a retreat off in the woods in February of 64 and came back with a totally different product plan, which involved then these memory levels but compatibility among them, a variety of language processes, two Fortrans, a, a card-based Fortran, a report program generator, two levels of COBOL, and a modular operating system that would start at 16K, of which you got to leave some space for the application program. <laughs> and so we said the operating system has got to be resident in 4K. And it turned out we couldn't do that, so we ended up making it 32K, the minimum size of OS. And Sure enough, we, did, we had a tape-based operating system for the small end, a card-based operating system, a little disk operating system called Basic Operating System. And those got delivered on schedule in February of 65 was the first one. Okay. The big operating system was in trouble. And so we patched and bailed, but it, by, by summer it was clear that we, we were still in trouble. And so Tom Watson invited me down to Armonk for a, a, one of these one-on-one -on -one luncheons in the executive dining room. And the two questions were, why don't you stay here? And I said that I really wanted to get back closer to the technical level, that being <coughs> corporate processor manager for the system was three. It's a great level because you're three levels from the bottom and three levels from the top, which means you know your people and the bosses know you. Okay, it's a really good job. But I was ready to get back to more technical work. And I said, I like to make things. And he said something I have never forgotten. He said, I do too. Have you looked at Poughkeepsie recently? <laughs> and you suddenly realize that this whole thing that had started as a typewriter factory and was now the manufacturing center for the computer industry was Tom Watson's creation. I do too. Have you looked at Poughkeepsie recently? It just raised my sights most wonderfully. <laughs> <clears throat> but then he said, well, will you stay another year and, and keep on bailing on the operating system? Here, if you will, here's what we'll do. We'll send somebody to Chapel Hill to teach your courses. You go one week a month to get your department organized. And when you all need a new computer in Chapel Hill, we'll help. Well, that turned into $900,000 later. It became the foundation for the Triangle University's Computation Center and became the negotiations around that became the basis for IBM choosing to research Triangle Park for a location and it is now at 13,000 people IBM's largest single location in the world. So that, that, you built something. no, he <laughs> built something, but, but that was a good offer. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I said yes and we worked out that I could have a, this took some fighting with the corporate organization folks because that I could have an associate manager of the operating system, Dick Case. And Dick and I worked like that, had all along. And uh, the, the corporate people didn't want any one over one kind of thing. But never mind, that worked. And so that's what we did. And so to find a person to go teach my courses, Lo and behold, George Kramer was getting ready to retire from IBM and he wanted to retire to Asheville, North Carolina when he got through anyway. So a year, and he was loved to teach and he was a mathemat, had taught mathematics bef before he went into the computer industry. So he would love to go and teach in Chapel Hill for a year. So we had bought a house, we rented it to George. I rented back a room in it and I commuted back and forth and when I was in Poughkeepsie, Dick and I were in charge, and when I was in Chapel Hill, Dick was in charge, and we got the thing turned around and on the track. Marvelous. So, Marvelous. so the size of the 360 OST, how big was that? 
It it peaked at about a thousand, mm -hmm. but that was that was a fairly narrow. Uh, I mean, it built up and it sure. went down, and it was one of the strangest things I ever tried to do was to organize an Orthodox synagogue. It turned out I needed to move the 110 programmers from the Time Life Building to Poughkeepsie. And a lot of them were Orthodox Jews, and they wouldn't move unless there was a synagogue. Well, that meant I had to get a, what do you call it, a mayim right. together, a minyam of 10, 10 Orthodox men. To, and I searched the Hudson Valley, and I, I could not put together a, an Orthodox synagogue. But that was <coughs> one of my stranger adventures. It was, <coughs> You know what a manager does. What's that? Whatever needs doing. There you go. And, <laughs> and you did quite a few things. Yeah. So from the time you began to turn around the OS until you delivered, how long a period of time was that? We delivered the first version, did deliver in April or May of 65, but it was slow. And it was November really before mm -hmm. a respectable version was delivered. It was November of 65. So in that process, sort of threefold questions, what was the best decision you made? What is the worst decision you made? And, and I'll come back to the third one in a minute. Let's try well, the worst decision is documented in the Mythical Man Month, and that was the decision to take the architecture away f from the architecture group and give it to the operating system manager. And uh, as I, as I document there, he's, he said it'll be so late and it'll cost so much, but it, and the uh, Marty Belsky, the architecture manager, said if you leave it with me, it'll be the same late. It will cost, but it'll be right. And he was right, and I was wrong, and that was a that was a multi-million dollar mistake. Wow. The The best decision in the whole program was certainly the 8-bit byte. Mm -hmm. The best decision in the operating system, well, the, the assembly language, surprisingly enough, posed a lot of technical problems because there were two <coughs> entirely different schools of thought had grown up in the scientific and the commercial sides. In the commercial sides, the assembly language served as a platform on which high priests of any different corporation wrote macros, and the troops programmed in the macro language. And so Eastman Kodak was a proponent of this and had done a really good job of that and various others. In the scientific community, the scientists would write their own macros that was, and they programmed in assembly language macro enhanced. And so the question of how to resolve all this led me into technical thickets that, the, the thickest technical thickets I got into in the operating system. The other set of technical decisions I made had to do with PL1 and the whole question of do we use equal for assignment following the Fortran tradition or do we use a colon equal kind of thing. And, but the more serious question is do we do independent evaluation of expressions so that you can factor out common sub-expressions? And the answer to that was yes, but that leads you to peculiarities such as one divided by three equals zero <coughs> because of data typing. Right. So I'm going to come back to the language issue for a moment. The third question of that genre is, and you may have already answered it, what was the hardest decision you had to make during that time? One that you just remember laboring over. During the during the operating system the operating time. System work. <clears throat> it's always people, and I won't go into personalities. I understand. But it was a matter of staffing them and yeah, and oh. removing them and that had yeah tough. yeah yeah. Tough. Interesting. So on the language side for a moment, PL one give. I'm not going to go into great detail on the OS 360 stuff because this has been documented quite well elsewhere. But tell me about the the evolution of the languages that came along in parallel with this. Who were some of the the principals you worked with on the PL1? Well, PL1 share put together a team. Yep. Uh, Jim Cox from Oak Ridge, I believe. Uh, George Radin yeah. from IBM. There were six of them in all that made the share committee doing PL1. One from 
England, I forget who. Uh, I don't remember the names of that committee, yeah. but they worked on the language. The, the basic concept was to make a universal programming language that would meld and displace Fortran and COBOL. Was now, Algol a factor then? Algol was not really a factor. Now, part of our product plan included delivering an Algol compiler. We had to. We had to for government reasons. <coughs> uh, but Algol was popular in Europe, and Algol had a lot of important concepts in it, particularly having to do with subroutine calls, parameter passing, that whole business that we had to master and adopt. The key what we saw as the most important steps forward in PL1 were the unification, the provision of a compile time mode, just like macro assembler, but if we'd been smart, we would have done a schedule time mode instead of doing JCL, all right. But mm -hmm. we weren't smart. That was the way. That's the worst mistake we made was JCL. Splitting JCL and, and well, 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 yes, the yeah. The, JCL, the, JCL. Well, the existence of JCL was a mistake. Building it on a card format was a mistake. Building it on assembly language was a mistake. Yeah. Thinking of it as only six little control cards instead of a language was a mistake. So it had no proper subroutine facilities, no proper branching facilities. Uh, JCL was sort of an expeditious decision, wasn't it? That kind of blew up. It kind of grew. It kind of grew. And but yeah. when you end up with your data definitions doing all the verbish things, you, yeah. because you've limited yourself to six verbs, that's a, that's a language mistake. So in some ways, JCL <clears throat> we didn't see it as a language. Was the fundamental problem? We saw it as a set of control cards, yeah. and lo and behold, they're still around the dusty <laughs> decks that nobody dares touch because. Yeah. They run and nobody knows what's inside. Right. Yeah. And, and people found ways around the simplicity of a language. Says that yeah. yeah. It was incredibly complex. Incredibly complex. The yeah. keyword parameters the set goes on and on yeah. and on and on. Interesting. Who led the JCL development effort? Cass Calzi. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and, uh, but that's not his fault. I no, mean, no, it, no. It was a strategic decision. Yes, yeah. Having JCL in the first yeah. place. He probably did a fine job, given, yes. given the constraints. Uh, so the important thing in PL1 was to incorporate in, a new, in a, the best modern knowledge and character processing as an inter okay, sorry. Keep going. Inco incorporate character processing as an integral thing. Yeah. So the substring, the in infix operator, these, these <coughs> character-based operators. The other hard question then is operator precedence, because as you get all these levels of operator, Ken's solution was very simple. There is no operator precedence. There is none, whatever at all. And so you better use parentheses or you're in deep water. <laughs> in PL1, we put in operator precedence, but it gets quite complicated. And, and I, think, I think the hardest technical decision was the question of shall you consider targets in evaluating expressions? And the answer was no. That now, I remember you writing Because of optimizing compilers. Yeah. I remember you writing someplace that, you know, IBM kind of waffled on its support for PL. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. That killed it. Yeah. Interesting. Back and forth, back and forth. And where they didn't waffle, like in the UK, Rolls Royce. I think may still be using PL1. All right, it it took off in the UK partly because it was being built in the UK at Herzler Laboratory, and so there was enthusiasm. But uh, IBM did the same thing with APL, on again, off again, on again, off again, when a wholehearted support would have made it happen. Now, could you have displaced Fortran? No, I now think that would have been impossible. Yeah. But you know, I still I still deal with chemists who are using Fortran. Could you okay. displace COBOL? Maybe so. Yeah, I think you could have displaced COBOL. Yeah. Yeah. And that community is more coherent. Yeah. It's more cent top down operated. Yeah. And PL one is a better substitute for COBOL than it is for Fortran. Yes. Yes. So things finally shipped, and the orders for three sixty were still. 
pouring in. I mean, yeah. Just well, if you look at the way. annual reports, yeah. the company goes, and then it goes like that. Yeah, and the seven and, dwarves go opposite and the, direction. And the seven the dwarves go in the that. opposite direction. Right, right. But we invested a fortune in that operating system. How much would you see IBM paid for that, or spent on, on 360? Oh, um, well, depends. Yeah. My hardware development budget was about $100 million. Yep. That doesn't count all the I.O. devices, the discs, the tapes, the yep. new key punches to accommodate 8-bit bytes, yep. and then the larger character set, and all that stuff. And it doesn't count capital tooling for the factories and all that. So what the whole program cost, billion. Yep. The software budget for OS, not counting DOS, yep. I think was somewhere in the neighborhood of four hundred million, nineteen sixty four dollars, which would be four billion today, roughly. So, so you know, you know sorry, go ahead. so quite a bit. And yeah, yeah. So, in your management, then, how long did you continue as manager for the three hundred and sixty work through Alpha Test, and okay. which was April of sixty five, something like and that. And then you passed the torch and, uh, on to, to Fritz Trapnell. Got it. Got it. So I, I'm not going to belabor your experience there because your you know marvelous book goes into so much detail on that. But give you the opportunity. Are there any untold stories from that period that come to mind? None that come to mind. I unloaded. <laughs> you unloaded there. So we'll move on from that. So from the time of the alpha period then on, did you have much customer contact, or were you kind of buried deep in the labs around this time? Well, I was doing a lot of sweeping up. And uh, we had customer, we did customer calls all during the program. Uh -huh. So, so it was a matter of you know telling the customers what's coming up, and, and we we them. had we did customer briefings, all uh, confidential briefings before announcement, two and three a week to any, major any customers. Any memorable ones? Any memorable customers that you just kind of blow blown away? Well, one one thing impressed me very much. I did a customer call on St. Paul insurance company yeah. and they wanted to present to us their computer forward plan yeah. who presented it the resident IBM system engineer <laughs> Fascinating. she had an office there she yeah. went there every 40 hours a week she was a part of the St. Paul team I had seen the same thing at Ohio Oil Company I was called upstairs one day they were going to had, they had an executive meeting of the president and the vice presidents, what computer to buy next. Included in the executive meeting was the IBM salesman whom they'd played poker with across the street for 20 years, who'd had that account, and Homer Barton was part of the decision, and the decision was do we buy another 650 or a 7070, all right? And I understood more about how that, I never regretted the 25% of my of my price that the marketing division took. I never, I never begrudged them that because of what they did. Yeah. These were heady In times. terms of real support. Yeah. I mean, the, the system engineer for St. Paul, I'm sure was getting paid more than St. Paul paid any of their people. Yeah. She had a higher degree of competence and she was an integral part of St. Paul's team. Yeah. She was an integral part of IBM's team. She was feedback to us as to what the customer needed, a strong advocate for the customer, and this was true of system engineers all over the all over the company. It was a very strong, very strong two-way street. Did you have a sense <coughs> when this was happening of the amazing role you had played, or were you just so happy working with the technology that was? I was happy. I, to I you? was happy. I was happy. Good. And from your peers in the Seven Dwarfs, by now their lights must have been burned out by being on so late. Were you uh, getting calls from them saying, Fred, I want to work for you? <laughs> no, because, you know, by the time, by time all this was happening, I was on the way out. True. Yeah. True. You were made fellow when in this time frame? I'm trying to remember in the history there. I never was made an IBM fellow. You were never made an IBM no, fellow? No. What a travesty. I no, I was, I was a line manager. 
Oh my goodness. Because <laughs> <laughs> the fellow program had started in 60 something, yeah. if I'm it's not mistaken. But typically they are mutually exclusive. Right, they are yeah. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So after the alpha work then, then that's finally when you moved on. Yeah. So was it a difficult transition? Were you happy to move on? No, uh, I was happy to move on and it was not a difficult transition. The, I love to teach yeah. and as I say, the, the atmosphere and the support at Chapel Hill yeah. in terms of my colleagues could not have been better. Yeah. So the head of the statistics department yeah. gave me one of his graduate assistants that he was funding. I didn't have any money to fund a graduate assistant. Yeah. We had, uh, so he funded one f yeah. out of his budget. F the, it was that kind of atti attitude everywhere. <coughs> the, the problems are different. In, in the management job, you have 13 people lined up outside the door with insoluble problems. In the teaching job, you had the inexorableness of tomorrow's lecture coming ready or not. And uh, so they're, the, there are pressures in both cases, but they're quite different kinds of pressures. Then the la in the last year of the 360 program, well, the, both the hardware and the software, I was on tranquilizers. But I had a working pattern that worked. My, my boss was in the habit of calling 6 o'clock meetings. And I, 6 a.m.? No, 6, oh, 6 p.m. Okay. And I finally went to him and I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go home and have supper and put the boys to bed. And I'll come back and meet with you from 8 till midnight, but I'm not going, not going to come to 6 o'clock meetings. Well, he was kind of shocked at this frontal assault. But I did that. And then it, I'd come back and do the paperwork, because there's a lot of correspondence in those days, a lot of little yellow slips and route this and handle that. No email back then. <laughs> no, no email. And uh, I'd do the paperwork, and then about midnight, I'd go down to the machine room when they were doing the shift change. Well, when they're doing the shift change, they were working four shifts and debugging the machines. The status is known, okay? And they'll tell you. And the bosses aren't there, all the intermediate bosses. Yeah. And so what they tell you is the truth. Yeah. Okay, well, this isn't working, and this is, and so forth. So I'd get a real good picture of how things were coming in the machine room every night before I went to bed. Those were long days. They were long days. Long days. Long days. So as you moved to Chapel Hill then, what did you love teaching the most? What was your favorite thing? The software engineering lab. Uh -huh. I love teaching computer architecture, and I still do that. I did the software engineering lab 22 years, but I don't do that anymore. And that was around that time that you <coughs> really began to start writing on the computer architecture yeah. book? Yeah, well, I started writing on the Myth Commandment. See, Tom Watson asked me this question at, at that lunch. He said, you've managed the hardware program and you've managed the software program. What's the difference? In all sincerity, he asked that. In all sincerity? Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I can't answer that one, but I'll think about it. Well, that's where the Mythical Man Month came from. Wow. And so I went home and thought about it yeah. and thought about it and thought about it, and five years later I had a, a, a book draft. Now, as I say in the book, <coughs> managing software is more like managing hardware than most software people believe, mm -hmm. and it is less like managing hardware than most hardware managers mm -hmm. believe. It has its own set of... Did you ever circle back with Tom and have that discussion on the answer to that question? No, I dedicated the book to him. <laughs> Tom, read this book. <laughs> so it's dedicated to Tom and Bob. Very good. Marvelous. So what did it mean to teach software engineering back then? Because here we're talking late 60s, early 70s. What did a software engineering course look like? I thought it as a problem, as a project course. And so... Uh, <coughs> There was one 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 hour one lecture a week. Then I divided them into teams of typically four. Yeah. Advertised around the campus for projects. Mm -hmm. Had them build stuff. Met with each team each week to. Mm -hmm. And I insisted that they choose a producer and a director mm -hmm. separate for each project. So the producer is the boss, responsible for the schedule and for resources. The director is responsible for technical content. Mm -hmm to get them into the habit of thinking that way on larger projects. I think that's a, I, I copied the terms from the movie industry, but I think it's 
I think it, it's the same as the architecture manager. Right. There's a delightful book by Jim Cotheen, <coughs> Organizational Patterns of Agile Development, in which he's studied the organizational structure of hyperproductive projects. And he doesn't use those terms, but in his analysis of many hyperproductive projects, you see that same binary star relationship. So you were one of the first people really teaching software engineering that, yeah, around right. that time. Who were some of the other folks that orbited in the academic space that were even thinking about that topic? Oh, I think. Uh, I think Corbato at MIT was, yeah. and because they had built the Multic system and faced many of the same same problems. Uh, Barry wasn't in the academic field; he was still at TRW. But he Barry was Bain. Barry Bain. Mm -hmm. He was thinking hard yeah. about all those issues. Yeah. Vic Basile has been thinking hard about all those issues, and Harlan Mills then at IBM was probably thinking as hard. I consider Harlan and Barry and Dave Parnas to be the three giants in the field. So tell me your interactions with those guys. Did you and, and Harlan ever cross paths? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Harlan's one of my heroes. He, Sweet uh, man. I, I've met him a couple a of times. This is a gentle, gentle Yes, man. yes. Yeah. A godly man. And, and Dave Parnas? Where and Dave you Parnas. Were well, I hired Dave. He, I didn't he, know that. He was on our faculty. That's an adventure. David and I jointly taught the software engineering course lab. And that's an adventure. Was it, where was this relative to his A7 work? Before, after, during? Uh, <coughs> I don't remember the dates of that. During, I think. Okay. I think he was, he had, I think he had started it. And then he hired Paul uh, Clement, yes, oh, who Paul was Clement, one of our right. one of our graduates, right. whom he picked up in our yeah. program to continue on with that work. Dave's not far from you. He's at the University of Limerick now, so no, he's been forced to retire, and he's moving back to Canada. Really, I didn't because know he that. hit age sixty-five or whatever the mandatory what retirement a age. What I thought he was just getting going there, doing good stuff. Oh, well, that's another story. <laughs> and then uh, Barry Bain, what were your interactions with him? Oh, I'm an admirer of Barry's. I didn't know Barry until his book came out. Uh, his software oh, book. Oh, mercy. That's the kind of book that you don't expect to see a successor to. Yeah. That, that's a 25-year book. Yeah, that's an amazing and book. And since then, I've gotten to know Barry well, and uh, uh, Barry's a person I like very much. Wonderful. Wonderful. So back to uh, uh, Chapel Hill then program started from nothing and grew to where it is. I mean, yeah. how, many, how many folks did you have uh, uh, on your staff teaching? How many professors? We have about 40 <coughs> a fac faculty. Mm -hmm. That includes some uh, research faculty who are grant funded. Yep. Uh, we have about 160 to 170 yep. graduate students. Yep. We have a smaller undergraduate program. We started as a graduate only program. <coughs> and we are, since we always saw ourselves as a middle-sized department, not a big one, yeah. we chose to specialize in our research areas. And yeah. so, and then so you know, let's jump ahead to the '70s. The microprocessor hit the microprocessor. The world. Yeah. How did that uh, hit your department? Did did you see it coming? I, did you? No, but I saw it when it got there. I saw what it that. It was what I absolutely had to know. So I put up my own money and went to a short course in, held in Florida, taught by the fellow at Livermore who was the microprocessor provider for all those instrument people. Yeah. And it was a hands-on course. We programmed microprocessors and interfaced them with stuff. What, what year was this? It was a weekend. I don't know. Um, okay. Mid-70s sometime? It was okay. quite early on. Okay, okay. And out of that, <coughs> it was like the 4004 or the 8080. It, it was the uh, one. It was the Motorola 6500. The 60, 6502. 65, no, 6500. 6500. Oh yes, yes, yes. Got it. Uh, no, wait a minute. That's not right. 6800. Oh, the 6502. 6502. 6502 is the knockoff. Yeah, on the that's the one. 6800. Yeah. Right. And uh, I was immediately impressed. 
and so as a matter of fact, I wrote a paper that I gave at IFIPS about what the micro meant and how it related to all the other computers. And that paper is incorporated in the architecture book. It's the introduction to chapter 16. Yeah. And the, the thing is that conceptually, it's more like the spaceborne computers than it is like the other computers because it was so restricted in memory and weight and so forth. And it was designed originally for control purposes rather than computational purposes. And so it is kind of a, a nephew to the classical computer, but a direct descendant of the spaceborne right. control computers. Yep. That uh, I, know, I do not know of anyone in the field that would have at that time anticipated that the production of any kind of computer would vastly exceed 100 million a year. Mm. In fact, during that time frame, you, you made a statement when we were talking earlier, you had also the rise of the mini computer, which yes. fundamentally changed, changed the business as yes. well. Yes. You used a great phrase in terms of from, you know, the... Sociology. The, exactly. So, so, so describe that to me again. All right. The, the mini computer was made possible by the diode transistor technology, yeah. but it was made important by Ken Olson realizing, and Gordon Bell, that there was a market for an instrumentation computer. And the, the register, the RTL, I believe it was called, logic that meant that you could easily interface your instrument to this computer, meant that it opened up all kinds of laboratory applications. It was a descendant of the MIT link, as a matter of fact. But the sociological thing it meant for both business and for universities was that you could have a computer that you controlled in your department instead of a glass house at the center that a high priesthood controlled and you stuck stuff through the slot and got stuff back. And the sociology of this is very important. In the university scene, it meant that all the central campus controls on the purchases of computers didn't apply because you you bought a chromatograph and it just happened to have a PDP-8 yeah. as part of it. Well, once you had the PDP-8, you're off and going. And the cost <laughs> thresholds were different, too. The cost yeah. thresholds were 50K yeah. Yeah. instead of 500K and up. And so the mini-computer revolution was, a <laughs> pardon me, a tremendously important. In a similar sociological impact. And then the, the same thing happened with yeah. the micro. Now yeah. you can have a computer on your desk that yeah. you control instead of the department yeah. controlling. <laughs> so I consider those sociological forces to be the technology enabled it, the sociology drove it. Right. And the next one I believe you mentioned is the <laughs> technology of the, uh, the embedded computer. And what's the sociological implication there as well, having machines embedded all over the place? I don't know. <laughs> Good answer. I think it's kind of like you know, how many electric motors are in your house? You don't think <laughs> about it. What was the first yeah. mini computer Chapel Hill got? Was it a PDP? <laughs> Excuse me, the first one we got in our department was a PDP 11. Oh. Well, it was, no, we got a. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't even remember the name of it. But it was a it was a deck machine. No. Oh, the the PDP eleven was a deck machine, yeah. and it was yeah. seen for general purpose yeah. applications. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Gordon Gordon Moore. Gordon, Gordon Bell. You, Gordon, Gordon Bell. Bell. Oh, sorry, Gordon Bell. Where did you where did you and Gordon first connect? <clears throat> it's hard to say. Uh, I was very impressed with his book, his computer architecture book, <coughs> and did a review of it. <coughs> I was invited to Carnegie Mellon and gave <coughs> essentially an oral review of it there. And I think that's when we first started having Got <coughs> serious conversations. Got it. Got it. When did you begin to start teaching courses on uh, microcomputers at <coughs> Chapel Hill? Were you oh, one right of the first away. ones I to mean, do so? Well, <coughs> if if you teach computer architecture, when the micro comes along, you start teaching micros. Right. You know. Any memorable students from that era that you uh, 
you mentored that have gone on to do some great things? Or too many to mention? <laughs> too, too many to mention. Uh, <clears throat> and one name is escaping me at the moment. That's very important. Uh, You'll have to blank that part. He went on the Intel and became chief architect of the 380 and 4, oh, 480. Okay. John. John Crawford. Crawford. John Crawford. John Crawford. Amazing. And Dick Seitz, who did the yep. Alpha at Deck, yep. <coughs> yep. was a student and a friend. Still is. So who are we moving from the 70s to the 80s? This little company nobody thought about much back <coughs> then, Microsoft was starting to pop up. And uh, were you involved in, uh, I think you mentioned some stories about the whole IBM decision of the operating system uh, going on to Microsoft and the like, and what a really bad decision that was. That was a really bad decision. <laughs> Do you think they could have known a priori, yes. or was it? Yes. <coughs> As I say, the technical advisory committee, they, the pressure from open to get something out. Yeah. <coughs> To compete with the Apple II was very great, yeah. and the the lab that Don was running was a closed lab, yeah. you know, stay home, leave us to do our business kind of thing. Yeah. A technical committee got that kind of late on the scene, yes. and the de the decisions had been had been made. Mm -hmm. They were very bad decisions. You mentioned the Apple II. That was your first <coughs> personal computer? Your first your first PC? Yes. Yeah. What did you do with the Apple II? What did you use it for? You Just messing it. around. <laughs> he didn't use it. But you did. She did. <laughs> I played on it. All oh, right. The boys programmed it. <laughs> the boys so programmed it. But then you have the story, jumping ahead a little bit, where you got your first Macintosh. Tell us. How you got your first Mac? Well, I, I after having a good, happy experience with the Apple II, I had bought an Apple III. The Apple III was not a market success, and the field of maintenance support for it was weak, and I couldn't get it to run regularly and reliably. Yeah. But Jobs, Wozniak, and I were at the White House in 1985 for the first National Medals of Technology. And <coughs> they had us in a back room before the ceremonies. So Who was president back then? I'm trying to remember. Reagan. Reagan, okay. Oh, oh, oh very impressive. And so we, we got to chat, and I said to Steve, I, I was having trouble getting my Apple III fixed. Could he help? He said, I tell you what I do. He was so proud of Macintosh. It was brand new. It had been out about a month, I think. And. Uh, he said, you send me your Apple III and I'll send your Macintosh. <laughs> so we did. And that sold me on the Macintosh. It was right. It was right in so many, <coughs> so many ways. And you've been a Mac user ever I've since. I've been a Mac user ever since. Your current machine is a? Is a Mac lap laptop. All right. Are the Intel version or the PC? No, I'm not up to the Intel version <laughs> okay. yet. Very good. My eldest son is because he's oh. he's full he's a full computer consultant, Indeed. so he moved on. I'm merely a user. <laughs> so here we are now in the '80s, and this madness called the web began. I had my first email address in '79 when it was the ARPANET, and I remember reading, <laughs> having a little book with everybody's email address in the world. When did you get your first email address? Uh, I don't know. It was quite early. Steve Bellavan. Yep. was one of our students, yep. and he's now professor at Columbia. Yep. And he, <laughs> his dwell time at Carolina was quite long in graduate school because he <laughs> did all kinds of other things, including originating net news. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, he took a year off to teach and now faculty. Yes. So he got us on email quite early. Very good. So here we are in the 90s, and the web begins to hit. And uh, how did that begin to change what you were teaching from a software engineering perspective? Did you, um, did you see it coming, what it was going to change? No, was change no. My, my, 
my prophecy is not very good. <laughs> and nowadays, you've been moving in the direction of, of uh, virtual presence, virtual reality kinds of things. Well, for, ma for many that? years, uh, one of the areas we picked for emphasis when we started the department was computer <laughs> interactive three-dimensional computer graphics. Yeah. And so I worked for 30 years with protein chemists on yes. and building <laughs> tools to enable them to construct protein structures from crystallographic data. And then when the virtual reality concepts came along, this is a natural extension of 3D interactive computer graphics. And we've been doing that for some years, looking mostly at serious applications as opposed to entertainment applications, training and things like that. And we've got a good team of people now who are carrying on that work. And some fascinating things you're doing in terms of uh, I remember reading some of the research papers, which, which others can take a peek at, just the notion of devices, glove devices, head devices, and all that. So where do you think that's going to head? If you were to project, you know, a, you know another generation ahead, are we, the, do you think that's all going to come together? To everyday use in the home, no. The, the industrial uses are important already. There are hundreds of big installations that are used for design review and tasks like that. And uh, those are going to continue to be important. <coughs> I think the projector-based technology is going to dominate the head-mounted display te technology. The things you can do with the little digital light projectors are just absolutely incredible. And work my colleague Henry Fuchs is doing and work people in uh, Ate Ha Zurich are doing just really nice. The work in digital paper, even. You know, yeah. Hanging things on. Right. Amazing stuff. <coughs> so l let me ask sort of one general question on the software engineering space and then I'll <coughs> go to some, some sort of ending up uh, philosophical questions. How have you seen the nature of software engineering <coughs> changing over the years? I mean, with the 360 work, you, you know, sort of built it from the ground up, those ideas of building a large Well, systems. we recognize we recognize that building big systems is building is different from building programs. And I think the distinction between a program a programming system, a program, a programming product, and a programming system system product is a fundamental distinction. And we got that far. The your work in object-oriented programming has just changed the field and uh, entirely for the better. All right. I'm not sure entirely, but thank you. I think I think so. <laughs> it it of course incorporates Dave Parnas's inf information hiding concepts in an elegant fashion and the con <coughs> concepts from Norway. But uh, there's still an awful lot we don't know about how to build comp complicated systems and keep them under control. In fact, you talk about <coughs> that in terms of the essential complexity of, yes, of software yes. systems. Uh, are you still pretty convinced that that essential complexity will never go away? Yeah. We, we, we will always <coughs> undertake things at the edge of what we can do. So there truly is no silver bullet. There truly is no silver bullet. No, what I argue in no silver bullet is not that there is, but that there cannot be. Right. All right. It's kind of like Gödel's theorem proving yeah. that yeah. certain things are totally impossible. Yeah. <coughs> Although you spoke on, you know, notions of Ada might give us some things, and Ada <coughs> never quite got there, but Ada certainly has influenced a yeah. whole generation of languages, certainly ahead of its time. Um, there have been a whole list of co contributions. Yeah. What I said in No Silver Bullet is in 10 years there won't be any single one that will give us an order of magnitude improvement. It, it isn't in the cards. Well, the 10 years have come and gone, another 10 years have come yeah. and gone, and I don't know whether we've had an order of magnitude right. improvement or not. Right. So for the generations after us, it's still going to be hard. And still the best answer is buy, don't build. And Unfortunately, so many of the commercial off-the-shelf products do not lend themselves to aggregating with others. <laughs> and the whole question of who's got central control yeah. 
means it's real hard to take an off-the-shelf database system <coughs> and do anything other than build your application on it, but melding it with another <coughs> system is difficult to do. Do you think perhaps this is one of the reasons that service-oriented architectures are gaining some traction? I don't know. I, I haven't tr tried to follow software engineering for the last decade. I, I no longer even read the literature. Ah, there's so much I, of it. I, Well, my whole intellectual life has been one of throwing interests overboard. <laughs> When I was a graduate student, you could know it all. There were two annual co <coughs> conferences and there were two quarterly journals. And you could know the whole of computer science. And I've been getting progressively more ignorant of my own field for the last 50, <coughs> 50 years. So what are you focusing on these days? You're here on sabbatical in the UK to finish up a book, I understand. Uh, on the proce <coughs> process of design. So, in fact, this is a theme you mentioned earlier that you were really fascinated <coughs> about, I think, as you called it, the design of design. That's the title of the book. Yeah. Got it. I lifted that from a, a <coughs> mechanical engineer at Cambridge here that I met many years ago. Gordon Glegg wrote a little book called The Design of Design, <coughs> and it exactly describes what I want to talk about. Very good. <coughs> so, the last two general questions. As you look back, oh, well, three general questions. As you look back over your career, where were you having the most fun? I have no complaints. It's all been fun. That's a great answer. Yeah. That's a great answer. <coughs> and to somebody who would be considering a career in the computer field, how would you advise them? Look at the intersection between the computer field and biology. The, the ablest young people today are often opting entirely to go into biology instead of computers. I think the intersection between the two is, in the first place, that may, that may not be a bad choice. The biology field offers the same promise today that the computer field did to me in 53. The wonders that are going to happen there have just begun to be tapped. On the other hand, the key to much of biology is information. Where is the inf <coughs> information hidden and how is it processed? And so for the information scientist and therefore the computer scientist, the interaction with biology and biology is the golden opportunity. And for any young person today, I would say go there, go there. That's where the fun's going to be. Very good. And the <coughs> last question is, you're a man of faith and unashamedly so, and I admire that. How we could go into a long history on that, but you along the way have probably had to make some hard moral and ethical decisions in, in what you've done, the hiring and firing. How would you say has your faith shaped your career and the decisions you've made? Is, is that a question we could go into? Well, since the hardest decisions are about people, you can't give very many concrete examples True. unless you do as my great grandmother said and tell don't tell names and tales both <laughs> <laughs> well but, said but uh, <coughs> yes I, I you try to seek the leading of the lord as to what to do and uh, he's he's been amazingly good so the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. So even with your uh, career and, and working on <coughs> software and such, you felt you know that was the path you should be taking. Uh -huh. Wonderful. <coughs> and I hope it's been useful. Oh, I uh, so. think history will prove that to be a resounding yes, Fred. So the last question is a meta question. Are there any questions <coughs> I could <didn't> ask you? <laughs> <laughs> Afraid not. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing well, I, I'll, an, I'll answer. Sure. I'll answer one you didn't ask. Sure. That is, how did I become a Christian? Yes, please. I and the answer is, when I was a, about 30 years old, yes. Jerry Blau yeah. invited Nancy and me, yeah. he, he and his wife, to a group Bible study in their home, uh -huh. a group of stretch team. And we started going, and we started facing the scriptures head, <coughs> head on. Yeah. And I had had Bible at Duke, and my, I had a background, but I had been educated away f <coughs> from belief. Yeah. And Great phrase. Uh, coming 
on the scriptures, and Jerry insisted that we not use commentaries of secondary material. <laughs> material. Just look at the scripture and see what it says and what does it mean and what does it mean for me. This is a pattern of Bible study em emphasized by InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Yes. And over two years, I came to see that the intellectual difficulties I was having as a scientist with Christianity were secondary, that the real question was, am I willing to completely yield to the Lord Jesus? And, you know, you worry about the miracles. Well, if you believe in the resurrection, all those other miracles are finger exercises. That's, well that's not hard for the Lord to do. If you don't believe in the resurrection, there's no point in any of it. So the real question is, do you really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and that he was the <coughs> Son of God? And after a period of more than two years, and Nancy got converted during that time. <coughs> uh, she was part of those studies as well? She, oh, yes. These were couples. Yeah. Uh, and many friends praying for me and me praying for a clear indication one way or another, then suddenly I was given the gift of faith and it hasn't ever departed. What church uh, do you go here in the UK, if I may ask? St. Lawrence is down the road here. St. Lawrence of Aris Well is where we've been <coughs> going, so Anglican. Marvelous. What a great story. Thank you so much for sharing well, so I'm much sorry with us. I have been in better shape. <coughs> Fred, if I'm in as a great shape as you are when I'm your age, I'll be dancing. 